everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over the differences between SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone versus diabetes insipidus, also called DI. I know a lot of people get these two conditions confused, so what I want to do for you is I want to break down um, the key concepts you need to know for NCLEX and for your nursing lecture exams. So what I'm going to do is I am going to explain how the antidiuretic hormone works, the ADH, because if you can understand that concept, all of this other stuff, like the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the nursing interventions will make complete sense. So after this lecture, I highly encourage you to go to my website, registerednursern.com, and take the free quiz. A link should be popping up in a card um, to test your knowledge on the differences between SIADH and DI. So let's get started. Okay, the key player in these two conditions is called the antidiuretic hormone. ADH, also called sometimes as vasopressin. This hormone plays a huge, huge role in SIADH and diabetes insipidus, and they work in the opposite of them. In SIADH, you're going to have an increased antidiuretic hormone. In DI, diabetes insipidus, you're going to have a decrease. So first, let's figure out the function of this hormone, because if we know what it does normally, then it'll help us understand what happens whenever there's too much of it or there's not enough of it. Okay, first, what is the function of ADH? What it does is it plays a major role in regulating the amount of water in the body. So it likes to keep your body nice and level with its water and it constricts blood vessels. So how does this do this? Okay, what system, ask yourself, what system in the body helps regulate how much water we keep and how much we lose. The kidneys, so it accomplished this with the kidneys. And what ADH does is it causes the renal tubules to retain water whenever it's being released. So that's how it does it. So for instance, say that um, you have a lot of antidiuretic hormone in the body. It's gonna cause those renal, renal tubules to keep water. So you're gonna have increased water in the body because it's not getting rid of it. But if you don't have a lot of the ADH hormone, antidiuretic hormone in the body, it's gonna cause the kidneys to be like, hey, let's just get rid of this. And you're gonna be losing too much water. And we'll go over this in depth here in a second. But let's look at the brain because areas of the brain are responsible for regulating your antidiuretic hormone. Okay, in the brain, you have your thalamus and right below the thalamus, you have the hypothalamus, that's where Hypo comes in below, so it's right below the thalamus. And the thalamus is responsible for producing this antidiuretic hormone. So um, it also plays a role in thirst. Whenever you get thirsty, your, thal your thalamus kicks in and says, hey, let's make the body have the urge to get something to drink. Now, right below the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland splits into two areas. You have the anterior posterior uh, pituitary gland, and then you have the posterior pituitary gland. Now, what we want to pay attention to is the posterior pituitary gland, because this is what plays a role in your ADH secretion and storing ADH. So let's cover this again, because you want to remember this. Your hypothalamus produces antidiuretic hormone. Now, it signals to the posterior pituitary gland to secrete it, and that is where it's stored. So just commit that to memory. Now let's look at these two conditions. Since we understand how ADH works in the body, let's look at what happens whenever there's too much or there's not enough of it. Okay, first, let's go over SIADH. Again, SIADH stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. Now, how do you remember which ones increase and which ones decrease? That's the big issue, right? Well, how I remember it is by this little um, mnemonic, this acronym thing. Okay, S-I-A-D-H, you have the I in the middle, and I just remember that I for increase, A-D-H. And then I know it's complete opposite for diabetes insipidus, so we have increase A-D-H here and decrease A-D-H here. So that will help you remember it. And then everything else literally makes sense. Okay, now what causes for SIADH for this antidiuretic hormone to be over secreted? Well, usually what's happened is either the hypothalamus has been damaged, because remember that produces our antidiuretic hormone, 
or it's being produced somewhere else in the body. What else in the body could produce the antidiuretic hormone, mimic it? Well, one of the number one causes of SIADH is lung cancer. It's one of the first signs that a patient actually gets. They maybe will go into the doctor, they'll be presenting with this, and the doctor will further look at it, and we'll actually see maybe small cell lung cancer in the lungs because the cancer is causing to throw is causing the antidiuretic hormone to be overproduced. So that is, I would remember that, that's a, a huge cause of this condition. Also, again, damage to the hypothalamus or the pitu posterior pituitary gland because those are responsible for your ADH regulation. Infection as well can cause it. Any really infections in the lungs, such as pneumonia or in the neurosystem like meningitis, and uh, other neurosystems like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And of course, medications can cause this as well. And what you'll wanna remember, one particular medication is actually used to treat diabetes insipidus because this medication has properties to increase the diuretic hormone because again, you want to increase the diuretic hormone in diabetes insipidus, but if you increase it too much, you can send them an SIADH. And it's called diapenese or the generic name is chloropropyl my and again it just has those properties that increases the diuretic antidiuretic hormone now let's look at the opposite in diabetes insipidus what are the causes of that okay with this you have the decrease antidiuretic hormone and usually what's causing this is there is either a problem with the kidneys because remember back in this part your kidneys are responsible for helping retain or getting rid of that water and it's sensitive to the antidiuretic hormone whatever that antidiuretic hormone tells the kidneys to do, they do it. So either there's an issue with the kidneys, the patient's taking a medication that's causing it, or the patient's pregnant, which we'll go in that here in a second, usually in the last um, trimester, or there's been trauma to the brain or the hypothalamus of the posterior pituitary gland. So um, the kidneys, like I said, they're usually not receptive to the ADH. So it's like, hey, we don't see any ADH anymore. Um, so we're just going to get rid of all this fluid because remember, ADH helps you keep water. Um, damage to the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, it's not working appropriately, so it's not sending those right signals. Um, drugs, uh, remember this drug, declomycin. This is actually a treatment for SIADH, and what it does, it has properties. It's part of the tetracycline, the anabolic family, but it's really a cool drug, and what it does is it causes the antidiuretic hormone to um, be inhibited. So it has properties to do that. So if you're taking this drug, it could cause diabetes insipidus. Um, gestational, whenever um, the patient's pregnant, the placenta, which is responsible for producing all those hormones, um, can produce too much of what's called vasopressnase, and this actually causes the antidiuretic hormone to break down, so you have no more antidiuretic hormone, and the patient's just urinating like crazy and losing lots of fluids. Okay, so how do these patients present with these conditions? Okay. This right here, it literally, if you can understand the antidiuretic hormone, these signs and symptoms of what you're seeing make sense. Just common sense. Okay, so again, let's recap. SIADH, remember the I, you have increased antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone, what does it do? It retains water. So when you are retaining too much water, you're going to have water intoxication all over the body. So how is this patient going to look? They are going to have fluid overload, too much water in the vascular system. So it's going to be backing up everywhere. You're going to have edema. The patient's going to have drastic weight gain, um, high blood pressure from where you have all that extra fluid in the body and there's just way too much pressure going throughout the body. You're going to have a fast heart rate from where the body's trying to compensate for all that fluid. So they're going to be tachycardic. Um, you're going to have hyponatremia. We talked about in that in the fluid and electrolytes video. This is actually that euvolemic hyponatremia where there's an increase of water in the body, but the sodium stays the same. And what's happening is that the sodium is actually diluted because of all that water. So the sodium level really didn't change. It just got diluted from conserving all that water. 
and confusion. Patient will be confused because they have all that water. The brain tissue is very sensitive to extra water, so you're gonna have swelling in the brain. They can be confused, lethargic, uh, at risk for seizures. Again, that goes back to the brain swelling. Uh, anorexia, because they are so full of water, they don't want to eat probably a lot of pressure on the stomach, causing them not to feel hungry. And um, another one, this is very important, they're gonna have a low urine output. And whenever they do urinate, which isn't very often, because they're conserving water. Remember, the kidneys are like, hey, we have all this antidiuretic hormone going on in the body. Let's not pee because we gotta keep all this in the body. The, whenever they do urinate, the urine is going to be very concentrated. So another way to say urine is concentrated, it's going to have a, they're going to have a high urinary specific gravity. So now let's flip over and let's look at the opposite. Because remember, these two conditions present oppositely of each other. Okay, how's this patient going to look with diabetes insipidus? They're the opposite. They have not enough of the antidiuretic hormone. Whenever you don't have enough, your kidneys are like, hey, we don't have enough of this, so let's lose a lot of water. We're gonna get rid of all this water through the renal tubules. So what, how do you lose water with the kidneys? What do the kidneys do? They cause you to urinate a lot. And whenever people have diabetes insipidus, they urinate up to four liters to 24 liters of fluid a day, which is lots of fluid. Now to compensate for that, they're gonna have polydipsia, which is increase in drinking this they're going to literally crave water and ice because they've lost all this water and the body's like hey we got to get some water back so they are going to just drink and drink and drink and try to hydrate themselves but they can't hydrate themselves because they're losing so much water through the kidneys and they're actually dehydrated you're going to see dry uh, mucous membranes skin is gonna be dry, their skin turgor is gonna be decreased, and they're also going to have hypotension. And this is because they've literally urinated all their fluids out and there's hardly anything for the body to pump, the pressure's gonna be low. And again, remember back to the beginning, um, one of the things that antidiuretic hormone does is it constricts blood vessels. That's another one of its properties. So um, here you have the opposite, you don't have enough, so you have dilation. When you have dilation, you have low blood pressure. Now remember back here, you had hypertension in SIADH, and that is again due to all the extra fluid, but due to the constriction as well. And here, whenever because they're going to be urinating constantly, like 24-7, their urine is going to be super um, diluted. It's not going to be concentrated. So they're going to have a low urinary specific gravity. And they are going to be having hypernatremia. They're going to have a high sodium level due to losing all that fluid. All that fluid's gone and all that's left is that sodium. So there's going to be a lot of sodium in the body and not a lot of water. Now, let's look at what you're going to do for this patient for your nursing interventions. Now to nursing management. Okay, things you want to pay attention to this because a lot of questions like to hit on. Um, they'll give you scenarios and you've either got to educate the patient, see what statement's correct, what's not, side effects of drugs and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the education pieces and you're looking at those common side effects for the treatment that the physician may order. So let's go over this. Okay, for both of these conditions, what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that you're getting daily weights on these patients that you are watching um, their intake and output very strictly. If the patient's alert and oriented, have them participate in this because you want to make sure that you are writing down exactly what they are taking in and putting out. And their safety, because these patients are definitely at risk for safety issues, either an SIADH due to all the brain tissue swelling, water intoxication, or diabetes insipidus. They're getting up urinating a lot. They're becoming dehydrated and hypo and hypernatremia can um, extenuate that confusion. Okay, so for SIADH, remember they have way too much fluid in the body because they have too much antidiuretic hormone which causes you to retain fluid. So we are gonna put them on a fluid restriction. Actually, the doctor will order this and you will implement this. Um, so you wanna make sure that they follow the fluid restriction. For diabetes insipidus, as the nurse, you want to make sure that they are not consuming any products like the family's bringing in or the patient themselves has ordered it on a tray. Foods that promote natural diuresis like watermelons, lemons, grapes, foods like that that promote the body to naturally urinate. 
And a big thing I would remember this is caffeine. So teas and coffees and energy drinks, things like that really promote diuresis. So you don't want patients with diabetes insipidus to be taking that in. Now typical medical treatments, let's go over the SIADH and what I would pay attention to is the side effects of these medications. Okay. So our goal with SIADH is to remove the fluid. We got to get them back to a good fluid status. So typically what a physician may order is a loop diuretic. Remember we talked a little bit about diuretics at the beginning. Diuretics promote diuresis and they have too much antidiuretic hormone in this condition. So they are not diuresing at all. They're keeping all that water. So this Lasix, Lasix, Lasix is a loop diuretic, is going to go in um, either IV or PO and cause the patient to urinate that fluid off. But what you got to watch out for that is that um, loop diuretics like to waste potassium whenever they're urinating. So watch out for hypokalemia and always check your potassium levels before you give your next dose of Lasix. Um, also, sometimes with that, the phys physician may order a hypertonic IV solution, like 3% saline. We went over this in the hypo, isotonic, and hypertonic video, and we talked about how hypertonic solutions work on the body, and it's really neat. So let's go over that real quickly. What's happened? Remember, we have way too much fluid in the body. Those cells are swelling, and what hypertonic solutions do, they go in, and they cause that fluid to be, come out of that cell, to shrink back down to normal. And whenever that fluid comes out, it's going to enter back into the vascular system. So you can hopefully urinate that out with the help of that diuretic that they're also started on as well. But what you got to watch out for is the patient's already fluid water intoxicated with this condition. So whenever you add the hypertonic solution onto it, it you can cause more water intoxication because you're drawing all that water out to that, of that cell. So you've got to watch out for worsening of that fluid overload. Like... All of a sudden you're hearing crackles, they have uh, difficulty breathing, their O2 saturations are going down, things like that. So watch out for that. And when you give this medication, usually they like to give it an ICU because it's one of those where you need to watch the patient very closely. Um, give it slowly per your hospital protocol and usually through a central line because it's hard on the veins. Um, another treatment, um, which is another popular treatment for this condition, is the declomycin. We talked about that a little bit earlier. This is um, actually an antibiotic in the tetracycline family. So think back to that. Um, and what this actually does, it has properties of inhibiting the antidiuretic hormone. So the patient takes this and it causes that over secretion of antidiuretic hormone to quit being so much release. And it promotes diuresis. So one thing you need to watch out for this is, of course, with the tetracyclines, you do not want to give this with cal calcium containing foods like milk and acids because it affects how the GI system absorbs the drug. Now to the medical treatment of diabetes insipidus. What are, what's going to be ordered by the physicians usually for these conditions? Okay, for a mild case of DI, um, it's not as popular due to the side effects is a uh, diapenes or the generic name chloropropamide. And what this actually is, is a type 2 diabetic medication. Now diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus where patients have um, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, and things like that, they require insulin, is two completely different um, disease processes. They are not alike even though they share the name diabetes. So do not get DI confused with um, diabetes mellitus. Okay, so what does diabetes do? Diabetes, um, what it actually does is it increases, it has properties of increasing the diuretic hormone. So, um, but a side effect of that, whenever the patient takes this, they don't have diabetes, but it's going to increase their diuretic hormone because they're low in the diuretic hormone. They can um, experience symptoms of hypoglycemia. It will drop their blood sugar. So remember this with this drug. You've got to watch these patients' glucose levels very, very closely and teach them about signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. And it causes the skin to be photosensitive to the sun. So they need to cover up whenever they go outside because their skin is a lot more susceptible to burns. Okay, next. Um, another treatment is a medication called desopressin. This is actually a form of vasopressin. Remember, vasopressin is also naturally occurring in the body as the, it's also called antidiuretic hormone. So this is just a form of an antidiuretic hormone replacement. Um, so the patient takes this, they can take this by mouth, 
IV, um, in the nasal passages, things like that. And it's also called Stymay. So um, the patient will take it. It's usually in extreme cases who are struggling with this. And when what you need to watch for as the nurse is for signs of hyponatremia. Um, because what you're doing is you're trying to give the patient more antidiuretic hormone. Remember what does antidiuretic hormone do? It conserves water. So the patient's conserving water. They're at risk for getting water intoxication, which will um, dilute those sodium levels. So you need to watch out for that. Okay, so that is about um, diabetes insipidus and SIADH. Now go take that quiz on my website, registernursrn.com, and see how well you grasp this material. And thank you so much for watching, and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.